Welcome to A Brief History of Embroidery Frames. On this first slide, you can see in the picture below, the lady has a slate frame that she is embroidering, and this painting is from 1603. What types of frames are there? There are slate frames, tambour frames, adjustable hoop frames, and scroll frames. Also, there are stretch bars and square hoops, but I won't be discussing that today. I'm mainly going to focus on the slate frames, the scroll frames, the tambour, and the adjustable hoop frames. So, slate frames. This wooden style of frame has four perpendicular sides with pegs or notches to help keep the fabric secure. Of the four perpendicular sides, there are two with mortises and two with tenons. A mortise is the hole that another piece of wood slides through. The tenon is a piece of wood being slid through the mortise, which is the hole. So if you look at the picture on the right hand side, the mortise is the hole. So that would be the two bars that are on the top and the bottom. The sides have the holes in them. And then the tenons, those are the two that go up and down. So they go through the two that are vertical, or sorry, horizontal. This type of frame can be fixed um, to trestles. It can have an independent foot or it can be handheld. A slate frame helps to keep the fabric taut, which means it keeps it very tight while it is being embroidered, which allows for even stitches and it does not warp the fabric. Here are a few examples of slate frames in history. On the left hand side is an illumination from the 14th century and it shows a slate frame being propped up with feet and that is um, at the British Library and on the right hand side is a painting of the Virgin Mary with the child Jesus. Mary is using a tapestry slate frame and the frame is fixed and set up on trestles. That painting is from 1440 and it's at the Bibliothèque in France. Here are a few more examples of slate frames. The, on the left is a slate frame, it has legs, and if you zoom in on the picture, you can also see it has the mortises as well as the plugs on the sides to keep it in the shape that it needs to be in. And that painting is from 1470. On the right-hand side, is uh, an etching and that was etched in 1532 by Alessandro. If I mispronounce this, I'm sorry, please correct me. Pag Pagin Paginino? Paginino. We'll go with that. But if you look in that etching, you will see where both women, they have the fabric taut. So you have the fabric and then it gets sewn pretty much in a little zigzag crossing all four bars and that's what holds the fabric both um, width and lengthwise and then the pegs get put in the four corners and that holds the wooden frame where exactly it should be. And if you look closely you will see one lady has a candle underneath. She's using the candlelight to be able to see the holes so she knows where to embroider. And then the lady on the right, she is actually using the windows. So she's using the daylight for her light for the, to see where the holes were in the linen to embroider. Here are some more slate frames. On the left-hand side is an example of silk embroidery being done on um, a slate frame in 1568. And that is from a German book called the I mispronounced this, I'm sorry, the Standebuch. On the right hand side is a similar frame, um, similar frame construction as we've seen in previous centuries, the same type of frame with the fabric stretched and then stitched onto the wooden frame. And then it's held up by trestles or by legs. And this um, is also a German 
um, engraving and it is from 1698. Also, the standard book, written by two different authors, two different centuries, but still the same type of embroidery frame. And more historical examples of slate frames. On the left hand side is an engraving. It's by Jan. I will probably mispronounce this. Swill, Swill Link. It's from 1627 and it's called Stitcher with Cupid. And with this, if you look, it's a slate frame, but there are no trestles. She's just holding it and it looks like Cupid is on the other side helping her hold it and helping her with the stitching. On the right hand side is an example of a very large embroidery frame. Actually, there are two very large embroidery frames, and this is from 1770. If you look closely, you can see the one frame on the right hand side is so large that there are two women sitting on either side of the frame doing the embroidery. And this is a large example of a slate frame being propped up by trestles. And more slate frames in history. On the left hand side is a painting from 1720. And if you can see on the frame, again, she's got the fabric and then it's stitched around on all four sides to hold the fabric in place and keep it nice and tight. On the right hand side is a portrait of Madame de Pompadour, which was painted about 1763 to 1764. And although if you look, it looks like she might be using a slate frame or a scroll frame, which I'll get into scroll frames in a minute, it's actually been noted that she's doing um, tambour work on that frame, which leads me to tambour frames. Tambour was a specific type of embroidery. Um, it usually used a circular, a circular hoop, and it appears to have emerged in European history about the 18th century, or at least that's when it gained popularity in the European world, and then also into the Americas with the Western world. So for this style of embroidery, the fabric in the frame must be so tight like a tambour drum. If you can hear the pop sound as your hook goes through the fabric, then you know your frame is tight enough. Tambour frames work well with embroidering small items such as a handkerchief. Think of tambour frames as being similar to today's modern adjustable hoop frame. And more about tambour frames. Tambour embroidery originated in India and Persia, and it's known as Ari work or Ari embroidery, named for the R, which is the hold needle tool that is used. Or, origins of this embroidery can be traced back to the 12th century and became popular during the 16th century in Gujarat during the Mughal rule. Today, Gujarat is still the richest place for embroidered textiles. This embroidery style was later imported to Europe during the 18th century and quickly became popular due to the sensation of it being an exotic embroidery. The style of embroidery is a chain stitch that is worked with a fine hook known as the R. The hook looks like a crochet hook with a pointy tip. Many of these embroidery frames were made out of metal, bone, or ivory. Tambour embroidery continued to be popular in Western cultures until about 1830 when a French machine was created that could do the same type of embroidery at 140 times faster than by hand. The inventor of this machine was, and if I mispronounce this, I'm sorry, Bartholomew. De Monier. He was a French tailor and he had obtained a French patent for his machine in 1830, a British patent in 1848, and an American patent in 1850 for his invention and it ended up being one of the early sewing machine inventions. A little side note about this gentleman. His machine, he had a few of them in his first shop after he got the patent in 1830 and I'll, 
I'm not quite sure on the year. I think it was 1834. There were so many tailors that were afraid of being put out of business because of his machines that they raided his or ra raided his shop one night and destroyed all of his machines. A couple of years later, he found more financial backing and tried to set up shop again. And again, his um, his machines were great, but so many people that sewed things by hand, like other tailors, were afraid for their own future that he um, they destroyed his machines, and this gentleman ended up dying penniless. But that's just a side note that he helped bring an end to the use of tambour embroidery in Western cultures. With tambour embroidery, it used a hoop frame most of the time, as we saw with Madame Pompadour, that she used a rectangle frame, but mostly they used hoop frames. So now we're on to other hoop frames. On the left hand side is an example of a hoop frame. Remember before where I said it was made out of metal or bone or ivory? You can see that example in the left hand side. That needlework stand is um, from about 1790 to 1800, and it's currently at the Los Angeles County of Museum of Art. And then on the right hand side is just your typical modern adjustable hoop frame that most people today are accustomed to. So hoop frames. Even though tambour work grew out of fashion, the hoop frame itself was still useful for other embroideries. For example, Today, cross-stitch embroidery may be one of the first uses thought of when you think of a hoop frame. But did you know that reversible cross-stitch existed in the 16th century? Check out the picture on the right. First time I saw this picture, it's at the v &A Museum in London. When I first saw it, I thought it was black work. Upon closer inspection, I was able to obtain pictures from the V&A Museum and I was able to zoom in and found out that that's actually reversible cross stitch. So I got to geek out about that. Anyways, today most hoop frames are made of wood or plastic. More on hoop frames. On November 17th, 1903, Helen A. Harms patented her invention for the adjustable hoop frame. Prior to her invention, circular hoops, like the tambour hoop, were typically made from metal, bone, and ivory. Those hoops were not adjust adjustable. She came up with the idea for an adjustable hoop, and that's why today they're made out of wood or plastic to help with giving that little extra bit of, I guess, bendability. I don't know if that's a word. And finally, we have scroll frames. On the left-hand side is a picture of a typical scroll frame. A scroll frame, it's similar to a slate frame. The main difference is that scroll frames have two roller bars with wing nuts on the sides. So you have on the sides just two straight pieces of wood with the mortises in them, those are the holes. And then the roller bars on this example are the ones that are horizontal. And those have the tenons that go through and then they have the, the nuts on the end. And then because of that, the roller bar, you can roll up much, a lot of fabric onto it. So this allows for a large piece of fabric to be embroidered at one time while still maintaining a stable fabric without warping the fabric. A hoop frame would warp the fabric because you're actually pushing the underneath frame into the fabric, and then that can warp some of the threads and then leave the imprint of the hoop frame on the fabric. It appears that scroll frames were born out of the slate frames during the 18th century. In the encyclopedia written by Diderot um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, de Ellenbert from about 1751 to 1772, 
And in the encyclopedia, it describes an embroidery frame as being, quote, composed of two roller bars, AA, and two stretcher bars, BB. The slate frame is better for the tautness for the embroidery, but the scroll frame allows for a larger piece to be embroidered. So depending on if you have just a single size, say 15 by 15 inches to be embroidered, use the slate frame. If you have something, say 15 by 48, then you'll probably want to use the scroll frame and then just roll your fabric onto the frame. It is known as a tapestry frame, but when you look at it online, you might also see it referred to as a roller frame, or I'll probably mispronounce this, Metier à Broder Anciens. Please, if I butchered that name, please let me know and correct me on how to pronounce that. Now, with this particular type of frame, if you look, it looks similar to a slate frame, sort of a scroll frame, but I would say it looks more like a slate frame. The difference is instead of having pegs in the top and bottom corners to hold the frame together, instead it's got wooden roller discs on the tops and bottoms to help provide extra tension. Uh, with this, I the earliest I could find examples of this was from about the 18th century, about mid-1700s. I can't find exactly when this type of embroidery frame came into existence, but it definitely became popular in the late 18th and definitely into the 19th centuries. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a painting. It's called The Embroidery Lesson. And this was painted in 1876. And if you look, it has the roller discs that is iconic of this particular type of embroidery frame. And here are some more examples of this type of frame in paintings. On the left-hand side is a, a painting called Lydia at a Tapestry Frame. It was painted about 1881. And again, if you look, it has the roller discs up at the top. On the right hand side of the screen, this is the funny part. The title is in German, but the painter was French. The, the painting is Interieur mit Jonger Frau am Strick Roman und Spielendem Katchen. So, pretty much, it's a young lady doing embroidery and playing with a kitten. And if you look at the embroidery frame, again, it's got the same wooden discs at both the top and the bottom that is iconic of this particular type of embroidery frame. While I was doing research, finding out about that frame, I also found other frames that I found interesting and wanted to share with you as well. If you look on the left-hand side, I found this portrait online. It was listed as being painted by William Geats, but I couldn't find much more information on it as far as when it was painted or where the painting is at currently. But if you look closely, to me, it looks like a scroll frame. If you look on the sides, you can see the like the, the little wooden toggles that would have been rolled on the sides for the tension bars. On the right hand side of the screen is a painting by Jean Baptiste. If I mispronounce this, please correct me, Poisman. And he was a Belgian painter and he was known for his Orientalist scenes. And if you look, it looks like she has just your typical slate frame. And more frames. On the left-hand side is a painting by William Keats. It's called Maternal Happiness. It was painted in 1898. And then on the right-hand side of the screen is, I forgot to write down the date. I believe it was around 1915. It was the early 20th century when this painting was done, and it's called Woman Embroidering by James Braid Sword, and I believe he was an American. And if you look, she has a slate frame in her hand. And more frames in history. On the left-hand side of the screen is a portrait that is Russian from 1780, and if you look, it looks like she has just a, a slate frame. On the right-hand side of the screen 
is a painting done by Jules David. And if you look closely to me, it looks like she might see. You. I want to say that looks like a scroll frame because it looks like the embroidery has been rolled over the top bar, but I could be wrong. It might be a slate frame, but to me, it looks like it's a scroll frame. And the painting, if you look in the bottom left corner, it's signed Jules David. I tried to do more research on this painting to find out exactly when it was painted or where it's currently at, and I could not find that information. So if you happen to find that out, please let me know. And more frames in history. Well, on the left-hand side is a painting by Nicholas Lefranzen from 1780. And in this painting, it is clearly evident it is a scroll frame because if you look, you can see the two roller bars on the top and the bottom and the fabric has been rolled over it. On the right-hand side of the screen is a portrait done by Franz Kramer from 1834, and it's a portrait of a girl with an embroidery frame. However, the thing I find interesting about this particular frame, if you look closely, the frame, instead of being a typical frame, it almost looks like a belt, like a belt you would wear around your waist. It has a little hole and the loop and everything like a modern belt would, and that's what's holding the fabric onto the frame and more frames in history. On the left-hand side of the screen is a painting of a Chinese embroiderer at an embroidery frame, and this painting is at the University of Oxford. On the right-hand side of the screen is a painting from about 1750, and it's Madame de Pompadour, and she's embroidering. And from the way it looks, it looks like this is probably a slate frame, and it's set up just like a table would be. So you have four legs and then the embroidery in the middle, which would be where like the tabletop would hypothetically be. And more frames. On the left-hand side of the screen is, it was actually a larger picture, but to zoom in on the embroidery frame, I just cut off most of the picture. And so you just see the embroidery frame. The picture itself is called Lady Jane Matthew and Her Daughters from about 1790 and if you look closely I want to say this looks like a slate frame like I said I had to zoom in on the picture but either way if it's a slate frame or a scroll frame I still thought this was neat because again it's set up like a table so you have just two legs the feet at the bottom two legs and then where the tabletop would be is where the embroidery is on the right hand side of the screen I couldn't find much information on this painting. That's why I put the link that I found it at. So I don't know who painted it or when it was painted. If you know any more information on this, please let me know, put it in the comments below. But the thing that I found most interesting about this painting is if you look, you can see the metal screws on the side of it being a scroll frame and where she could then add the fabric around the roller bar, and then tighten up the screws on the sides. And more frames. On the left-hand side of the screen is a painting by Francois Hubert, if I mispronounced this, I'm sorry, Drua. It was painted about 1767, and it's of the Marquis de Comment la Force. And here, to me, it looks like she is also painting with a, or I'm sorry, not painting, embroidering with a scroll frame. It has the roller bars on the top and the bottom. On the right hand side of the screen is a painting from 1770 and it's just labeled Portrait of a Lady. And um, it does not, to me, it does not look like it has the toggles on the side. So it might be just a slate frame. Either way, it's set up with the feet and the legs, and instead of a tabletop, you have the embroidery frame, which seems to be very iconic from this time period. One thing I did notice with looking at the different styles of embroidery frames is in the 18th century, the frames 
the legs were on the sides and it was set up like a tabletop. Whereas in the 19th century, there seemed to be just one leg and then you would put your knees on either side of that one leg and then the frame was in the middle. On the left hand side is a painting from roughly about 1766 to 1784. It's labeled as the Fair Lady Working Tambour. Tambour is a type of embroidery. If you want more information on that, check out my previous video on embroidery frames. This painting is at the British Museum. On the right hand side of the screen is a, is a window and it is from about 1350 to 1360 and it's German. It says Frau mit Strickraman auf Glas Malerei and it's at the Austrian Museum in Vienna. And if you look closely, it's just a, a simple slate frame that she's embroidering. And more frames. On the left hand side is a very simple slate frame. It's very obvious it's a slate frame. And it's from about 1730. And this was done by Martin Engelbrecht. On the right hand side of the screen, is another slate frame and this one is an engraving labeled embroidery lessons and it was engraved in 1689 and here are some actual examples of embroidery frames rather than just simply looking at paintings on the left hand side is a mid 18th century embroidery scroll frame from France it's housed in the palace of Versailles and if you look you remember why I just mentioned about the legs being on either side? So your feet would be in the middle with the legs of the embroidery frame on either side of you. On the right hand side is, it's also an 18th century, but it's a later 18th century embroidery slate frame from North America. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this one has the more iconic style that you see more in the 19th century with just a single leg holding up the embroidery frame. One of the differences between these two frames, if you look on the left-hand side, it's a scroll frame. You can see the toggles on the sides the, where the screws are to loosen up the, the roller bar, roll your fabric on, and then roll it tight. On the right-hand side of the screen is just simply a slate frame with the mortises and the tenons. And just in case you're curious, I wanted to throw this in. This is from the Le Encyclopédie from about 1770. And it just shows you exactly how the tambour embroidery frame was put together. An example of a slate frame today is on the left-hand side. And as you can see, you've got the mortises, you've got the tenons, and then there are the four little pegs. On this picture, you can only see the two on the top. Those are the little metal pieces, the little metal pegs that go into the holes that hold the bar exactly where you want it to keep the fabric nice and tight on all four sides. And then after that, you can stitch anything like um, bias tape onto the edge of the fabric and then sew the bias tape and sew that onto the wood. On the right hand side is an example of just your traditional adjustable hoop frame. And like I said, with a hoop frame, you actually have two hoops, one on the bottom and one that's a little bit larger on top. And then the one that's on top, you adjust to how tight uh, you can get it. So that way your fabric sits in there. It's nice and tight inside that hoop. The only problem is by putting your fabric into that hoop, the fabric will then get the the impression of that that hoop so when you take the hoop off especially if it's like linen fabric that you're using it will still show that circular spot where the hoop had been no particular order the items that you will need for today you will need pins your fabric i will be using linen fabric, scissors, thread. I'm also going to be using a thin yarn, but that's up to you if you want to use the thin yarn or only use the thread. A needle, 
bias tape, and obviously your slate frame. My slate frame is 15 inches by 15 inches, and as you can see, I'm using a scrap piece of fabric. So first I'm going to trim everything down to make sure that this fabric will fit onto my frame. Once you have your fabric square cut out, next you want to take your bias tape and you're going to cut two strips the same length as the fabric. Next you'll want to unfold the bias tape and then you're going to line one on the right edge and then the other one on the left edge. So as you can see I'm unfolding the bias tape and I've got one corner up here and I'm pinning it down. Okay, one side done. Now time to pin the other side. And now that I've got both sides pinned, now it's time to take your needle and your thread and you're going to sew up both sides. Right now I'm threading my needle. Now that I've got the thread doubled, I'm going to put knots in at the, at the end of my threads. And with this, the stitches don't have to be neat, they just have to be secure. And to help secure the thread on the other side, I like to take my needle and stick it in between the two threads. And then pull it tight. From here, I'm just going to do a simple stitch just to secure the bias tape onto the fabric. Just like that. There is a fold. There's actually two folds, but there's a fold right here from where the bias tape had been folded, and I'm actually unraveling that fold and then that's where my stitches are going. So I have a straight line to follow. And once you have one side stitched up, go ahead and knot your thread and then get started on the other side. For the pieces of your slate frame, the two with the holes on the ends, these are called mortises, which would make these two the tenons. The tenon is the piece of wood that will go through the mortise, through the hole. And you want the two that have the tape already on there. And from here, I'm going to stitch these onto each other. So if you see, I'm matching up the edge of the fabric with the edge of the tape here. Now once you are done pinning right along here, now it's time to sew it into place. And from here, I am just sewing it, the fabric, onto the tape. Once you're done sewing the one side, go ahead, knot off the end of the thread, and then get started on the other side. And now that this side is sewn on, time to pin it to the other side. Now, 
time to sew this side. Next, you want to slip the tenon through each. There's one, and here's the second one. Now you'll want to take your four pegs and put them in the holes to stretch the fabric. Once your pegs are secure in the holes and your fabric is stretched, I'm going to flip the spring over. And remember that thin yarn from before? You can also use string if you like. And I'm going to cut off a long piece here and thread my needle. and you want to tie it around one corner. What you're going to do is wrap the thread around the right leg and stick it through the bias tape. And then just keep doing that and it will start to look like spiral lacing going up the leg. And if I can get my knot out, pulling it tight. And now as you go, you'll notice some of the string will start to relax. You'll want to pull it tight as you go up. Now as I come up to the end on the other corner, I'm going to do one more around the leg through the bias tape. And now if you can see, I've got some loose string through here, so I'm going to go to the very bottom, make sure it's pulled tight, and tighten up each strand as I work my way up the leg. And now that I've done that, now I'm going to knot off this end, so I'm going to wrap it around the leg, there, around the corner, and I'm going to knot it again through the loop, through the middle, put my thumbnail over the knot, and then pull tight. And one more time, just for good measure. And now that my thread is knotted, your corner knotted off. Now you want to wrap 
the yarn around the leg through the bias tape and just do the same spiral lacing that you did before. And through the bias tape. And as you can see, I'm at the other corner, but I've got some loose threads here, so you want to go back to the very beginning, pull tight, hold it in place, pull the next string, hold it tight, next string, and just work your way up. This will help make sure that your fabric, as you can see, it's getting tight like a drum. And once everything is nice and tight, then you just want to knot off this corner. And congratulations, you have dressed a slate frame. If you have any questions, please submit them below. Please like my video. And if you want to, want to see more, please subscribe. Thank you for watching.